Hey there, welcome back fabulous people to another scary episode of Darkest Real Dark Web Horror Stories. Today we're covering some horrifying deep web tales. Before we begin, I have a question for you. If you could travel anywhere in the world, where would you go and why? Let us know in the comments. Feel free to share any scary story ideas too. Oh, and don't forget to show your support by liking this video. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on next terrifying scary stories. Also, be sure to check out the other scary stories we've shared on this channel. Alright, the ritual is complete. Turn off the lights and listen closely. These real deep web tales are super creepy. Allow me to just preface this by saying that I never used the deep web for anything too bad. I never bought drugs. I never stole movies or music. Hell, I rarely even looked at porn. I had the most generous wife you could ever imagine. I honestly didn't need porn with a woman like that in my life. I had always been fascinated by computers, but the town I grew up in was a small hick town, if that. I remember hearing about computers and the internet, and the idea of it blew me away. Being able to access information from anywhere in the world was amazing and it astounded me that it wasn't embraced and pursued by more people. So I not only lived in a technology desert, but my family wasn't exactly rich either. My mom slaved away at a large corporation where she was paid much less than she was worth. My dad worked various odd jobs, but always invested most of his time into the local church. He was a stereotypical Bible thumper, and as one might expect, I grew to resent the religion. I always felt like religion was a one-way street. They expected me to pray to and serve some deity in the sky, and all those who don't would burn in hell. My interest in history led me to the realization that every religion was similar in that regard, and that for me was enough to dismiss them all. Thankfully, they raised my sister and me to work hard. We both went to college and got decent jobs. She became a nurse and moved to New York. I followed my passion for history, and eventually became a world history teacher at a small high school. I married my high school sweetheart shortly after getting my teaching job, and we moved into a more populated suburb not too far from where I grew up. We found a nice house that was close enough to both of our jobs. My wife and I had been saving up money because we were trying to have a child, although it was taking longer than we thought. After about a year of trying, we saw a doctor. He said that we were both able and healthy, but it would take some more time. This was almost nice in a way because we had more money than we needed for when the baby came. I decided to take a few hundred dollars and get that computer I'd been dreaming about for years. I was so excited when my wife agreed that I should. We couldn't raise a kid in this day and age without a computer after all, right? Well, I put it in our home office, and I quickly became enamored with the thing. I can honestly say that my life would have been so much better if I'd had one of these growing up. I could literally learn anything in the world I wanted. I found myself reading dozens of articles, speeches, books, and watching tutorials. I could not have been any happier. Time marched on and I found myself finishing up the semester and getting ready for the summer. It got pretty boring, honestly. I still got paid for it. But because the school was such a crappy district, there weren't many things for teachers to get involved in over the summer. That was when my genuine interest in the internet became something of an addiction. I was on that thing at nearly all hours of the day. Since my wife and I were still trying to have a baby, we were having sex like two animals. Life could not have gotten any better. Unfortunately, when things get that good, they can only get worse. It was a month and a half through the summer vacation when I found myself reading the same shit on the internet. There was nothing new, or at the very least nothing worth learning about. However, I did recall hearing about something strange. It was called the Deep Web. I never studied it in depth but I eventually had a basic understanding of it. I downloaded Tor and started looking around online. I made sure to be extra careful because I have heard stories of people being stalked, kidnapped, or even killed from using the deep web. I found myself staring at dozens of random links on the hidden wiki at 3 o'clock in the morning. I kept clicking away until something, anything useful came up. I did end up finding a lot of mathematics and science stuff, but I'm a history teacher. I'd rather learn about history. A few more hours of searching and I found something that at least remotely piqued my interest. It was a conspiracy theory page. Now I don't consider myself to be anything of a conspiracy theorist, nor am I the least bit paranoid about things like the Illuminati, 
But these were some of the most solid arguments for foul play from the government I had ever seen. There were classified documents, in-depth research, and an overwhelming amount of evidence for almost every theory I saw. Don't get me wrong, there were a few that seemed a bit far-fetched, but the vast majority of them made some damn good arguments. Eventually, I couldn't hold my eyes open any longer and had to go to bed. I powered down my computer, and as quiet as a mouse, crawled into bed with my tender, loving wife. I felt a bit of a void between us, though. She never had the lust for knowledge like I did, and if I were to ever tell her about the crazy and interesting things I read online, she'd playfully tease me that she was falling asleep or something to that effect. The next day, I was right back on the deep web looking for new things to widen my worldview. Nearly an hour had gone by, and all I had found was a bunch of broken links. I was about to sign off when a box appeared in the corner of my screen with a link in it. Being as naive as I was, I clicked on it. I was absolutely mortified at what I saw next. At first glance, I thought the abomination on my computer screen was some kind of a torture video. No, I was dead wrong. A toddler whimpered as he sat there gagged and bound. Covered in blood and piss, he begged the man in frame to stop, but to no avail. A deranged man in a Guy Fawkes mask stared at the camera as he thrust his body to and fro. A few seconds went by when the man finished and he got up to do a strange dance. If there was a cross between a football player's victory dance and a circus clown's opening act, the resulting atrocity might resemble the strange act the man performed over that poor child. To my horror, I realized it was a live feed hooked up to a webcam with a live chat box on the side. It took a few minutes for the shocking realization to fully wash over me. After I'd collected myself, I foolishly started to read what was in the live chat box. The most horrid and disgusting things you can imagine were being requested. I had a hard time believing that real people were behind a keyboard somewhere in the world typing these things. I really don't want to go into too much detail about what they were saying. It suddenly dawned on me that I could just close this shit and be over with it. I jolted the mouse and clicked to X out the page, but nothing happened. I felt my stomach drop. What? What the hell is going on? I kept asking myself. I'd never heard of anything like this happening. I was about to manually reboot my computer when the man from the video stream called out my full name. Leaving so soon, Mr. Edwards? Off to teach another history lesson at that little shithole you call a high school? He asked in a rough, distorted tone. I had no idea what to do. I clicked every button on the computer, keyboard, and mouse. No matter what I did, there was no reaction. I heard him start reading off my credit card information, and I'd had enough. I unplugged my computer from the back and powered it down. It was a relief to have finally left that nightmare of a web page. I was in awe at the speed he was able to get my personal information. I changed my credit card number and any other information I could. My wife was a bit suspicious, but she didn't pry too much at it. We had a very trusting relationship, and I didn't want to frighten her, so I kept the incident to myself. A few days went by, and I didn't even go into my office. I left my computer in there unplugged, admittedly scared to turn that damned thing on ever again. I knew I'd have to eventually face my fear, so I entered the office. I booted her up and everything seemed to be normal. I deleted Tor and made sure to be done with the deep web. I casually loaded up Google Chrome and everything seemed to be perfectly fine. Nothing seemed to come to fruition from my little mishap and decided I was going to be safe after all. Oh, how wrong I was. About five months later, my wife's sister ended up moving in. She really was such a pleasant woman. And we did have extra space, so we decided to allow her to stay with us. It was just a few weeks later that my wife and I got the good news. She was pregnant. She was already a couple weeks in, and she and the baby were both healthy and in good shape. It was the best feeling in the world getting that news. I had gotten back into the swing of things with my job and occasionally reading some decent articles on the internet. It wasn't long before we were days away from the birth of our daughter. I had completely forgotten about the events that had transpired the night I decided to use the deep web. It was a typical Sunday afternoon. I sat on my back porch drinking some cold sweet tea and listening to the hum of nature. Natural life can be so beautiful. Alone I sat, in a serene peace, seemingly impenetrable from the vile world that lay outside the boundaries of my own little haven. That was when I heard a crash and screaming coming from my house. Immediately I thought it was my sister-in-law watching TV too loud, which she had a tendency to do. But then I heard my wife sobbing uncontrollably. Panic sunk into my heart and I dashed into the house. 
I entered the large living room just in time to see a large masked man slit my wife's throat. I screamed at him but he didn't even acknowledge my existence. I was screaming uncontrollably and ran toward him with intent to kill. I smashed a glass lamp over his head but he didn't even flinch. I was questioning if he even felt it or not. He turned around and grabbed me by my throat. He lifted me up off the ground and brought my face close to his. You thought I forgot about you boy? I instantly recognized him as the man from that deep web live stream I saw all those months ago. That was the last thing I remember before waking up. I awoke to see my sister-in-law's mangled corpse on the floor. It looked like she'd been cut in fucking half. To my horror, I saw my beloved wife's body there drenched in blood. I sobbed uncontrollably for some time. I'm still not sure how much time passed while I knelt there and sobbed. Time may very well have stood still for all I knew or cared. But after I composed myself, I noticed something strange about my wife's corpse. Her stomach was not nearly as large as I had remembered it to be. I crawled over to analyze her body further. The wicked idea danced across my imagination. I pushed her on her side and my hunch turned out to be true. That sick bastard had cut my child out of my wife and had taken it. It was certainly far along enough to have been born at this point. What the fuck was I going to do? I called the police and the operator's apparent apathy toward the situation did nothing but anger me. 911, what's the emergency? The operator said in an uninterested tone. Someone killed my family, and I think they took my daughter. I frantically let out in a single breath. I continued to tell them my address. We'll have someone over there as soon as we can. The way she said that frustrated me. Here I am, sitting in a puddle of my family's blood. My life's been drastically changed forever, and she makes it seem as if it's just another day at the office. Where's the empathy? Where is the compassion for your fellow human being? After days of investigation and questioning, they were unable to find the killer or my daughter. I told those lazy fucking cops that this man found me and my family because I used the deep web, but because it was so long ago and I couldn't find the website again. They couldn't do anything about it. They called it a random act of heinous violence. And within two weeks, the story did make the local news, but nothing more happened than that. I guess it wasn't shocking enough. The whole incident was forgotten, and people were worried about the next terrible thing. How could I live with myself after this? My entire family was dead because I was snooping around something I had no business to be partaking in. The following weeks were the worst of my life. I would drink as soon as I got up, and then drink all day. Alcohol was the only escape from this fucked up reality I had to live with. I was a shell of a human, nothing more than a clusterfuck of negative, hideous emotions. Misery became my only companion, but I had no one to be miserable with. I had to live this horrible fate alone. Years had gone by when I looked into the mirror to see the unshaven face I'd come to despise. Every day I thought about where my daughter might be. Maybe they sent her away to live with a nice loving family across the country. I half-heartedly deluded myself. Deep down, I knew she was most likely raised in some human trafficking ring where she'd be beaten, raped, or even worse, in some hellhole filled with those sick fucks. I slowly made my way to my porch when I saw a familiar vehicle pull into my driveway. I could barely remember who it belonged to. When I saw his face, I instantly recognized him. It was my father. I hadn't seen him in years. Son, I know you're hurting, but this is no way to live your life. Do you think you can move on? I looked up at him, grimacing. Do you think I'd be here doing this if I could move on? He gave me a rough look and said that I needed to get revenge. He placed a revolver on the table in front of me, gave me a stern nod, and left. I was honestly shocked. This was the most religious man I'd known in my life who argued against the killing of any kind. I didn't know if I could do it, but I started to think of how many people those bastards had done this to. I can't be the only one. So, if I were to theoretically go through with this, I'd really be doing the world a service. No fuck that. I'm avenging my family, and I'm going to save my daughter. Over the next couple of days, I drained my bank account and purchased thousands of dollars in weaponry and ammunition. I quickly realized there was a lot of illegal stuff that would come in real handy. I turned back to the deep web to buy spying equipment, heavy weapons, and explosives. It took about a month to gather enough supplies for my suicide mission. And as I sat in my basement with thousands of rounds of ammunition, pounds of explosives, and almost 20k dollars in spying equipment, I knew I was going to wreak havoc on these sons of bitches once and for all. 
Days went by and I began to feel lethargic about the whole situation. I hadn't any idea of how I was going to find these people or even if I could. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Two weeks went by of endless hours on the deep web, looking for the bastard who'd taken my family away from me. I came across something that seemed almost familiar in a way. It was another live stream of people torturing a child. I felt a vile hatred rise up from the pit of my stomach. I knew this wasn't my guy, but I'd grown too impatient to wait any longer. If I can't find the needle in the haystack, I guess I'm just going to have to burn down the entire thing. I thought to myself with hatred oozing from my pores. I made use of some of the spying equipment I bought and was able to figure out where these bastards were broadcasting from. An evil grin stretched across my face when I figured out they were right here in my own state. I loaded my car with a machine gun, an AK-47 and C4. I started my drive. This may have been the longest two hours of my life. I was so excited to finally kill some of these sick, disgusting people. After almost taking a wrong turn, I found the rusty old barn house the torture porn was being broadcasted from. There were surprisingly only a few people there. A total of four men were running this operation. I watched for a while, but they never came out of the barn house. With my AK-47 in hand, I made my way to the entrance. I could see them raping a small boy, no older than twelve. He was crying hysterically and covered in blood. They were completely oblivious to me. I aimed my rifle sight down. Admittedly, it took me a minute to actually pull the trigger. Pulling it was much harder than I would have thought. But seeing these sickos violate this defenseless child made me realize these people really were better off dead. I opened fire and screamed, fuck you, as loud as my lungs would permit. From what I could tell, at least two of them were dead. One was shot, but alive, and the fourth noticed quickly enough and got behind a truck. He had a pistol on him and fired back at me. This guy must have been legally blind or something because he missed pretty damn bad. Minutes went by and I slowly crept around to the other side of the building. The one with the gun was screaming at the other one to get up, but he was clearly unable. I got as close to the other gunman as I could in preparation to kill him. I aimed my sight, but I must have made a noise because he heard me. He spun around and shot. The bullet nearly grazed my skull. The gunshot was deafening. I ran toward him, expecting him to have had just fired his last shot. He had. I put a bullet through that motherfucker's head. I stood over his bloodied corpse for a brief minute. I wanted to spit on it, but I didn't want to leave any evidence for the cops. So I resisted the urge. I walked over to the bloodied one I shot earlier. Laughing as I did, I placed my boot on his throat. He kept begging for his life, but there was a better chance of hell freezing over before I spared him. I made sure his last minutes on this earth were as miserable as possible. Glaring down at this sick man, I knew I was doing the right thing. I knew I was ridding the world of scum. Please don't kill me, this wasn't my idea, he begged. What did you fucking say? You have the nerve to try and talk you way out of your inevitable death? How dare you? I pulled my leg back, and in one swift motion I kicked his skull in. His gray matter spilled all over the floor. The poor boy was sobbing uncontrollably. I pulled out my prepaid cell phone, dialed 911, and told them of the situation. I told the boy to forget this night and then turned to walk away. The ride home seemed to drag on for hours. I'd heard so many things about having PTSD after killing people. So many articles online said that after killing someone, you'd almost always feel guilty, even if you know you did the right thing. But the truth was I didn't feel guilty at all. I felt powerful, more powerful than I'd ever felt in the years leading up to this day. I knew after I saw that babbling pile of shit beg for his life that I was going to kill again. It felt so right to have someone begging for their life and knowing that you weren't going to grant them their wish made it all the more satisfying. My life continued like that for many months. I'd spend almost all my free time on the deep web trying to track down anything that could lead me to my daughter, and killing anyone I deemed worthy to die. I was like an over-the-top vigilante or something. Jesus, those were the days. Eventually, I became more involved in the private sector and started accepting payments to kill people. I'd gained enough notoriety in the criminal world that almost anyone knew who I was. I just wish I could go back in time and tell myself how much more money I could make by simply killing people. It makes me realize what a waste of my life teaching those hopeless dipshits really was. I was making chump change compared to what I make now. People apparently pay good money to have someone killed. I'd already made just under three million in the past six months, and I didn't even have to repeat the same monotonous lecture seven times in a day. I almost became apathetic about ever finding my daughter again. She was most likely dead or even worse. 
She could be anywhere in the world, and the odds of ever finding her were next to none, I thought. One day, a connection of mine told me he had a really good gig set up. He said that if I could kill three people well enough, I could become a regular for an underground overlord. For those of you that don't know, this was the kind of guy who had more money than God. He ran a lot of the underground operations and even had a strong affiliation with the Silk Road before it shut down. I knew this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I jumped at the chance. I went over the information. I immediately realized these were going to be the highest profiled people I would ever kill. When I first discovered I was going to have to kill a family with a young child, I was mortified. The only people I have had to kill up to this point has been other criminals and sadists. How was I going to bring myself to take the lives of a seemingly innocent family? I would never even know why exactly I was being hired to kill them. You can't ask questions like that to the higher-ups, though. Anyone who did was normally killed themselves, or at the very least ostracized by the organization they were trying to work for. It was a pretty serious business I got myself into. I had no problem with that. I only did what I was told and nothing more. That was part of the reason I gained so much notoriety in my field. In fact, most people in this field never even get a chance to work for the Overlord. And if you're wondering why I keep referring to him as the Overlord, it is because he does not communicate with you directly. There are a lot of people looking for him, and he's responsible for billions in damage and the loss of countless innocent lives, although they don't have a lot of information on him as of right now, and will probably never catch him. The next day I was going to have to start tracking down this family I was ordered to kill. But that night, I was in a small bar in the middle of nowhere, downing alcohol like there was no tomorrow and contemplating how exactly I was going to bring myself to do this. I knew in the pit of my stomach that I wasn't a murderer. Well, let me rephrase that. Not a murderer of the innocent. I had no problem killing the evil men of the earth. I encountered so many sickos in my life. How could someone torture an animal or another person? I still couldn't bring myself to understand how anyone could do such a thing. Even if I found the man who kidnapped my daughter, I wouldn't torture him. I'd end his pathetic life and be done with him. Even after all the pain and agony that bastard put me through, I still knew I was better than him. I wouldn't become the monster the I sought to destroy. The bar began spinning after I downed my fifth shot, and I immediately came to regret this. I didn't feel threatened by the few others in the bar before, but... Once I lost control of myself, it seemed as if I became all that much more paranoid. I became so much more vulnerable to those around me, and I couldn't die just yet. I knew the events that were soon to come would be life-altering. I had this great feeling about this next job and the opportunities it would bring, which is quite unusual. I never feel intuitive like this. With hopes of surviving until tomorrow, I drunkenly made my way back to the motel I was staying in. The snow and ice outside made it much more difficult to get there. As sad as it is to say I ended up falling three times before I got home and locked the door. It wasn't a far walk, but adding strong alcohol to any walk makes it seem like a journey around the entire globe. I lay down and the thought of becoming the most powerful criminal in the world rushed through my mind before I went to the realm of the unconscious. That night, I dreamt that I was a hero destined to save the world. The next morning, my ears were assaulted by the alarm I'd set on my phone. I downed a couple aspirins to cope with the headache and got to work. The family I was going to be attacking lived in a relatively populated area, and I knew if I was going to pull this off, it would have to be quiet. I sharpened three separate knives and placed them in my coat pocket. The idea of bringing one of those blades across the neck of a little girl rushed through my mind and made me sick, but I knew that sacrifices were going to have to be made. I knew I had to be bad for the greater good. Unfortunately, I'll never even know why I'm killing this family, but I did my best to separate myself from the idea that these were good people. They had to have done something pretty bad to have powerful criminals hiring hitmen to kill them, right? I drove my SUV to their neighborhood and parked down the street at 3 o'clock. Looking toward their backyard, I could see the father, Ronnie Williams, on the back porch. I knew I was going to have to kill him within the next half hour because the mother, Bridget Williams, would be picking up their daughter from school and would arrive home at 3.30 every day. I thought to myself how easy this job was to do since someone else had done the monotonous task of stalking these people and recording their schedule. I locked my vehicle and started walking toward the house. I knew where they kept their extra key in the front yard garden and made my way into the house from the front. I waited for Ronnie to come back into the house for 10 minutes before I started to become impatient. 
I was going to need time to hide the body I thought and knew I needed to do this fast before Bridget and her daughter got home. I decided to push something over in the kitchen and hid behind the refrigerator as Mr. Williams slowly crept into the house saying, Hello. I realized how truly inept this guy was by this. I waited until he came close enough and I reached over to slice his throat open. He screamed much to my dismay. I tackled him and plunged the knife into his neck violently, nearly cutting his fucking head off. Watching the blood drip onto the floor drained me in some way. I sat over the lifeless body of a man who never saw me coming. I collected myself and dragged his body to the basement. My goal was to leave no evidence for the police to find. Making my way up the stairs, I heard the front door opening. I remembered the blood all over the kitchen floor. Shit, I said to myself. I heard the woman and her daughter started screaming at the sight of the gruesome murder. I quickly rushed upstairs. Ma'am, I need you and your daughter to remain calm. I'm part of the FBI. I'm afraid a murderer has made his way into your house earlier this day. I said. I want to see some identification, the woman abruptly demanded. I pulled out my fake badge I always carried around and showed it to them. Anyone who knew anything about federal badges would easily detect it was a fake. But most people don't. Is my husband all right? She asked me. I told her he was downstairs. She slowly made her way down the basement stairs, and I followed closely behind. When she located her husband, she fell to her knees and began sobbing. That was when I pulled out my knife and slit her throat from behind. She was dead within seconds. Now for the hard part, I thought to myself. I made my way back upstairs to find the little girl. She was nowhere in sight. I frantically looked all over the house, but she was nowhere to be found. I grew increasingly worried. I knew I was being watched by the Overlord, and if he saw this clear display of incompetence, it would hurt any chances I had of working for him. I began walking up the creaky wooden stairs to continue my search. I knew I heard a sound coming from behind the door. I slowly and quietly made my way toward it. I wrapped my hand around the shiny doorknob and began to turn. A large German Shepherd dog jumped on me, biting my arm. This caught me by surprise. I'd been wondering where that damn dog was. I struggled with the beast on top of me for a few minutes. But it was not long that I had my blade through its skin and its blood soaking the cold wooden floor. After composing myself, I continued my search for the girl. This girl is barely six years old, I thought. Where could she have gone? There were enough rooms in this house that this could take a while. But I knew the longer I was here, the worse it was for me. I checked each room in the house thoroughly, but found nothing. That was when I remembered the girl's father had built a fort in the backyard for her. That has to be where she is. I began outside and exited the back door to the porch. I saw that the small makeshift door on the fort was closed and knew I'd find her in there. I walked over and opened the door to the fort. She screamed as I forcefully pulled her out of the fort. All her energy was spent trying to free herself. I tried calming her down, but to no avail. She was crying and sobbing uncontrollably. I brought her back inside to finish the job. I threw her to the floor as I mentally readied myself to drive my knife through the little girl's heart. I could feel my own moral compass screaming at me to stop this madness. It was hard enough to kill the parents. How was I going to kill their daughter now, too? I closed my eyes and brought my knife close to her chest. She was screaming but I did my best to distance myself from the whole situation as much as I could. I closed my eyes and began to focus. The screaming stopped and I opened my eyes to see the lifeless corpse of the little girl oozing blood onto the floor. I started sobbing as the realization of my actions washed over me like a tidal wave of guilt and regret. I had to do it, I had to do it, I kept telling myself. Yes you did, a strange voice exclaimed behind me. It sounded really familiar, but I had no idea where I heard it before. I turned around to see a large, masked man standing behind me. He began to speak. I know this whole ordeal has been difficult for you, killing your own daughter and such. But I'm... What did you fucking say? This was my daughter. But my daughter has been dead for years, I said, cutting him off. What do you think I did when I kidnapped her from you, Johnny Boy? I stole her from you and gave her to a loving couple incapable of having a child of their own. And honestly, they did a much better job of raising her than you ever could have. He calmly stated, Why would you do this to me? 
Because I can. And if you even think of attacking me, a bullet will be through your head so fast your fucking head will spin. I didn't know what to do. I fell to my knees and began sobbing. Why did I let this happen? Why God? Fucking why? What the fuck was the point of any of this? I thought there was something strange about her. How could I have been so stupid? People always say, when you look into the abyss, the abyss looks back. As I stood there over the corpse of my dead daughter, looking into the eyes of the man who'd led me down the road to hell, I knew I was no longer looking down toward a monster. I was looking at an equal. The amount of self-loathing and hatred that lurked in my soul left me devoid of any other feelings. I knew that I was even more despicable than the monster that dragged me down here, for he at least knew he was doing wrong. I have been nothing but a vigilante masquerading as a hero. I'm no hero. I never was. It's ironic in a way. I became the very thing I set out to destroy. I looked up at the overlord and said, did I pass the test? He looked pleased with my response and nodded his head. He extended his arm to help me up. After getting back up, I lunged at him and managed to place a knife directly into his throat. As I did, a bullet flew by. It was so close that I felt the air from the bullet on my skin. I was so lucky to have made it out of there alive. I still don't know how I even managed it at all, though. After achieving that small piece of justice that I'd been waiting for, everything else was a blur. I wrote this as soon as I got home. Thinking back on the whole thing, it seems surreal. What a terrible time it has been this last little while. I don't think I want to continue very much longer, though. I miss my family. I miss my unborn daughter. When I'm done writing this, I think I might just join them. This all started a week ago, when I lost my job and was running behind on bills. I lived in a simple house, and that job was all that held my life together. After a night of drinking and watching TV, I started looking for a new job. Most of them looked boring, just nine to five office jobs, but one caught my eye. It was an ad to the side of the screen that read, High Paying Jobs for Hire. This isn't just your normal nine to five job. In desperation, I clicked on the shady ad. Slowly but surely, a new website loads, with multiple links to different jobs with different descriptions. Deep web jobs. House sitting. $100 per shift. Stay in a camera room. Watch all rooms. Keep the house safe. Rules in link. Seems easy. I thought to myself, God, do I regret that. Crop harvest. $150 per field. Harvest a field of corn. Tools are provided. Rules in link. Reading down all the jobs, the house sitting seemed the easiest, so I clicked on the link, eager for the hundred dollars. On the screen, a sign-up sheet popped up asking for my email. I typed it in quickly and was met with the message, We hope to see you soon. Satisfied with that, I hopped in bed and turned off the lights. I start to drift off when I hear a buzz from my phone, irritated. I get up and check my phone. A new email. I thought to myself, I clicked on the notification. Your application has been accepted. Thank you for applying to the house sitting job. You will stay at the house from 12 a.m. until 4 a.m. And you must follow these rules. Your money will arrive at 6 a.m. after your shift. Always, no matter what you hear or see, stay in the camera room. Either don't bring your phone. Or if you do, do not turn it on. Even if you get a notification, I will not email you during your shift. Make sure to bring something that can play music fairly loudly. Arrive at 12 or a little before 12. If you arrive past 12, do not enter the house and send me an email. From 12 until 1, you are allowed to roam the house but make sure to be in the upstairs camera room by 1. Turn all lights off, lock the doors, and close the blinds. From 1 until 2, watch the cameras. If you see a man in the living room watching TV, Turn that camera off until you hear the TV turn off from downstairs. Ignore any sounds you hear around the house. If you feel anything touch you, stop moving and close your eyes until the feeling goes away. From 2 until 3, open the blinds in the camera room. If you hear a voice from the window, do not look at them. The conversation will be normal and once they say goodbye, it is safe to close the blinds. This event can happen anytime in the hour. 
If you see a woman cooking in the kitchen, you have a blue button on your desk that turns on a loud sound in the kitchen. Press and hold that button until the woman disappears. From 3 until 3.33, turn on your music device as loud as possible. Cover your ears, close your eyes, and ignore any sounds or movements around you. If the music stops, make any sound of your own to drown out what is happening around you. After 3.33, you are allowed to roam the house until 4. Do not leave before 4, and do not leave more than 5 minutes after 4. If any rules are not completed correctly, hide under the desk, and do not move until 4. That is all. Your shift starts tomorrow night at 471 Pedersen Drive. Sincerely, Mr. Salazar. I must have read that email 10 times over thinking this was a prank or something. No way do I actually have to follow these crazy rules. I thought to myself, entranced at how specific the rules were. I put my phone back down to charge and went to sleep, still confused by that email. All I could do the next day was think about what that email said. Man in the living room, woman in the kitchen, conversation with a person in the window. It all seemed too crazy to be true, but I couldn't help but to find myself 15 minutes before 12 with an old iPod in my pocket, standing at 471 Pedersen Drive. I entered the house. It had a sort of old but still livable vibe to it. The house was dusty, but the kitchen and living room were spotless. I made my way upstairs and at the end of a long hallway stood the camera room. It was barren and small, with nothing but a chair, a camera monitor, and a couple windows in it. I sat down in the chair, man. I hope this is worth it. It wasn't. Looking at the computer's clock, it's 12.03. I have one hour to look around the house. First, I head back to the living room, close blinds, lock doors, and turned lights off. Repeat that for all rooms. And at 12.56, I was back to the camera room. As soon as it hit one, I felt a sudden dread telling me to get up and leave right now. I turned on all the cameras and, on the back of my neck, it felt as if a feather was resting on it. I froze. Keep calm, Chris. Keep calm. I closed my eyes as I remembered the rules. It felt like hours, that feather tickling the back of my neck, but I held out, not moving and keeping my eyes closed. The feather went away. I opened my eyes, relieved, and heard behind me slow, coordinated footsteps. I whipped around. The footsteps went away, and a slow chuckle came from the camera speaker. The man was watching TV. The TV was lit up with some cooking show, and the man was chuckling while watching the show. I turned that camera off and hoped I had done it fast enough. The sound from the TV echoed up the stairs, chilling me to the bone. What the hell is this place? I thought to myself, feeling queasy. And how is it only 1.20? The next 20 minutes were creepy as can be. Unknown sounds bounced around the house, the man laughing at the TV, watching all the cameras, until the silence hit me hard. The TV had been turned off, and dread had fell upon me again. The noise from the TV had been a constant for the past 20 minutes, but now that it was off, the silence felt threatening. I slowly turned on the camera and found the room to be empty. I sighed in relief. For what felt like an eternity, my eyes darted around the cameras, on edge, until the clock made a quiet beep, and it turned to a wall. I rose from my chair and opened the blinds revealing the pitch black lawn outside. I sat back down as the clanging of pots and pans ringed in my ears. I looked down at the blue button beside the monitor, then at the lady now cooking black eggs in the kitchen, and as I was about to press the button, Hi Chris, a woman's voice came from the window. I froze, gluing my eyes to the monitor, forcing myself not to look at the window. Hi, how was you your day? My voice was shaky, it was obvious that I was scared. I was just strolling around the neighborhood, saw you were here, and I just wanted to say hi. The window she was talking to me through was high enough up the ground to need a large ladder to get to. How was your day? My day was, it was f fine, thanks. The woman in the kitchen started to get louder. Okay, well I have to go, it was nice to meet you. It was nice to meet you too. Bye. I wanted to get up. I wanted to just close the blinds and never hear her voice again. But something just told me that I should not get up. 
Wow, you're a smart one. I thought that would get you. Hmm. Maybe next time. Goodbye. I waited a few seconds. The last thing I want to see was the face of that lady talking to me. So I waited until I was sure she wasn't there anymore. Then closed the blinds. Once that ordeal was over, I realized that the lady in the kitchen was gone, even though I never pressed the button. Oh no, oh no, no, no. I thought I had broken one of the rules, and it was only 2.30. Now, I'm sitting under the desk typing this out on my iPod, and there is a lady with a ragged apron on walking in circles around the room. I'm scared to make any noise. So please, if you see an ad for dark web jobs, don't click it. It's 4.30 now. I made it out of the house and I'm safe. My left leg is hurt a little, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you what happened. The lady from the kitchen walked around the room making soft groans and drooling everywhere. I kept as silent as I could. Freezing time she turned in my direction. A small beep came from on the desk, notifying me that it had turned three. The lady in my room melted into the floorboards, screaming a scream of the utmost agony and pain. What I was supposed to do at this point was turn on the music on my iPod, close my eyes, and cover my ears, but hiding under the desk. I didn't know if I still had to do that. I waited and waited, and silence was all I could find, until the walls and floors of the house started to contort. The house shifted and moved into what looked like faces popping out of the walls. The only description of the sound I can think of is a scream of terror itself. I couldn't take it anymore. My mind told me to get up, to run, to get out as fast as I can, but I knew I couldn't. I closed my eyes and turned the music on. The screams were drowned out, and it seemed almost calming, but in the back of my mind, I knew what was happening around me. The music blared loudly, and my eyes stayed glued shut. Then the music turned off. I opened my eyes and the house was normal again, shakily. I stood up and looked at the clock. 3.34. I got back under the desk and lay there, terrified. But nothing happened, and I was sitting there for 35 minutes until the final beep from the clock came, telling me I could finally leave. I got up, walked down the hallway, down the stairs, to the front door, and finally the sweet, cool air of the night hit my face, and in that moment... I felt a relief that was almost euphoric. I walked home and picked up my phone, but when I went to email Mr. Salazar, his email was gone, the website was gone, and there was no trace of him at all. I tried to fall asleep, but I couldn't get the faces out of my head. The look they had can't be explained. I don't know if I'm going to get my money, but at this point, I don't care. I just want to never go back to that house again. Update, it's six while now, a package somehow appeared at my door, and inside was eighty dollars and a letter. The letter is as follows. You can't escape. Hello again, Chris. I see that you showed up for your shift this morning. I appreciate that. But during your shift, you broke one of the rules. I've taken twenty dollars off of your pay because of that. I'm pretty sure you're already aware, but I can tell. You don't want to go back. Most people don't. And I'm here to say you can't escape. By entering that house, you pretty much signed your soul away. No matter what you do, you will always be at that house by twelve. That is all sincerely, Mr. Salazar. My sleep last night was horrible. I couldn't stop thinking about what happened on my first shift. The whole day I stayed in bed, terrified for midnight to come. But it had to come eventually. 11.57. I begged that nothing would happen to me. 11.58. I put my iPod in the trash. 11.59. I lay in bed and close my eyes. I feel pressure on my feet, and my soft bed disappears from under me. I open my eyes and find myself inside that cursed house again, with my iPod and a printed paper of the rules in my hands. What? How is this possible? I think to myself. I ran to the door, slamming my fists against it, wanting any way out but to no avail. I couldn't leave. I defeatedly walked up the stairs and sat in the camera room chair. I sat there, crying for an hour, until one came, and with it, came the man laughing at the TV. I turned the camera off and continued to sob. 
not caring about the sounds around me. But then, I felt a hand wrap around my neck. I froze, closed my eyes and tried to control myself. The grip closed tighter and tighter until I could barely breathe. Then it finally left me alone. I gasped for air and grabbed the printed paper of rules given to me at the start of my shift. I looked at the printed sheet of rules and at the bottom was a handwritten message from Mr. Salazar himself. Good luck. I looked back up at the cameras and composed myself. Okay, Chris. You can do this. You've already been here once. Pull it together. I listened, not hearing the TV anymore. I turned the camera on and the clock let out a small beep. It had turned to Wawa. Uh, I stood up to open the blinds but hesitated. Did I really want to talk to her again? Regardless, I pushed the thought away and opened the blinds to be met with a face only insane people would call a woman. It looked as if she hadn't eaten once in her life. Her skin looked like it was airtight to her bones and she had no meat in her body. Her smile was literally ear to ear. Her skin sagged down at least two feet and her eye sockets had large black bloodshot eyes with tiny beady yellow pupils. Hello again, Chris. I closed the blinds as quickly as I could and went to hide under the desk. But the desk is just a block. No space to hide under. I don't know what to do. I hear slow footsteps coming up the stairs. Oh God, the doorknob is turning. The door is locked. Oh, thank God I remembered to lock it. She is screeching from behind the door. She's slamming her hands on it. It's only a matter of time until she breaks the whole door down. What do I do? Do you know that a person can survive without water for only three days? But Mahatma Gandhi was able to survive as much as 21 days without food. Those were things I used to know as a normal student in a small town. I know none of those things anymore. I just know about rage and feeling constantly hungry. I was in my last year of high school and working a part-time job so I could save money for higher education. Things were dull but mostly fine until an otherwise normal afternoon after classes. It happened in the light of day. I was shoved inside a vehicle with expertise. I never saw the faces of the men that took me. I never saw their van stinking of old blood and rancid food. I could only see the blackness of my blind and taste the slight sweetness of chloroform before I lost my senses. When I woke up again, I was completely naked in a poorly lit room. The state I was in made me expect the worse, but there was no pain or bleeding indicating that kind of violence. It was cold, and there was a maddening dripping sound. Something was gleaming in the dark. As soon as I adjusted my eyes, I realized it was a knife. Drip, drip, drip. The small room had nothing but an already dirty toilet. The knife and a crack on the ceiling dripping slimy, slightly green water. The walls and floor were gray and featureless. A very strong light, like a camera flash, popped into my face, blinding all my senses with the shock. It disappeared after a moment, and I heard a voice. We want to watch your suicide. Let's see how long it will take. They took someone unremarkable, frail, with nothing to live for. But now I had a purpose. I had to frustrate my captors. If they wanted to watch my suicide, I would be the most resilient person in the world. I wouldn't grant their wish. Back then, I didn't know I was being watched by a bunch of sick and twisted people who kept up with my daily misery in the comfort of their houses and their anonymousness. I slept on the cold, hard floor. Food never came, and the only source of water was the murky leak on the ceiling. I drank it, humiliated. It tasted worse than shit, and I would know that, since I fed on my own waste during the first few days. The only indication that a day had ended was the blinding flash and the same cold, mocking voice telling me that they were surprised I had made it so far. I was so hungry, so hungry, so hungry. The room was getting hotter from my breathing every day. There was no proper ventilation. It seemed to be just enough to not let me die from carbon monoxide poisoning. A merciful death compared to the one they planned for me. I didn't know why they chose me, I still don't know. I never wronged anyone. I never excelled at anything to be a target of one's envy. It was just a purposeless act of evil. The fact that it was completely random made my hatred grow, and with it, my determination. My stomach hurt beyond words. 
I was constantly sick from the putrid smells all around me. My body ached all over. My skin was matted and flaky, my hair falling from malnutrition. I grabbed the knife. I felt watched in cruel anticipation. Not today. I chopped off my left pinky and shoved it in my mouth before I could think too much about it. My own blood dripped on my chest as I chewed on my own bones. The crunching sound should be so sickening. My teeth should be hurting so much or even breaking bone against bone. I should be horrified to phagocyte a part of my own body. But I was just so happy to be eating. After that I felt my body growing stronger every day. Like a member of the cannibal tribe on Papua New Guinea. After ritualistically feeding on their departed loved ones. I laughed maniacally for hours at a time and trembled endlessly. But I was more alive than I've ever been in that captivity. I rationed my food body wisely. I needed my right hand so it was crucial to spare at least four fingers on it. But I was free to feed on my left hand. My toes were pretty much useless. I've been dragging myself on the floor to move around anyway. But I didn't need to feed on myself for long. No more than a week after I first took a bite on myself. The voice after the blinding flash had something else to say. We are selling you. The official story is that I miraculously escaped my perpetrators during their flawed operation to move me to my new owner. And by the time I had reached a neighbor and the police was called, they had already fled the crime scene. The investigation was kept under extreme secrecy, so I didn't make the world news. Hell, I only made the local news as local teenager mutilated by unknown man. Someone even donated me a prosthetic hand. The police was able to take down the website where my daily tortured was being streamed non-stop. And just then, I found out that I was a star. I laughed for days because everyone felt so bad for me. Not knowing that the torture I endured was way beyond losing a hand and a few toes. I laughed for days because I know the truth no one else does. I know how. Right when they opened the door to my prison, my body felt like it was possessed by a bestial creature. And before I knew it, I used superhuman strength to crush the bones of five men all at once, then eat their fresh corpses whole. I even licked the leftover blood from the walls before I opened the doors and headed to the closest house, dragging my bad foot. In that moment I felt like I was the co-pilot of my body. The wheelsman was a voice screaming kill and devour. I could never escape if something hasn't taken hold of me. I'm not strong or even fast. I'd do anything to spend the rest of my life quietly, having my body and mind slowly heal and recover from a devastating trauma. The problem is that eating the raw flesh of my captors was the most pleasant experience I've ever had in my life. And while I've been chasing mercilessly all the monsters that watched my suffering for their own enjoyment, I'm too hungry. Their tainted flesh has not been enough for me, no, for us. 